Hello and welcome to Reservoir Red Dogs. Don't forget you can email the show rrd1865 at outlook.com. Tweet us at rrd1865 and leave an iTunes review. Uh, please, please it helps other fans find it. I'm Matt Ford and this is Paul McGregor. Hello, Paul. How are you, Matt? Really good, thanks. Um, and this, I'm so excited for people to listen to this. Obviously, and it's a running joke, I love all of these episodes and I <laughs> idolise anyone we have on this show and I think anyone who's worn the shirt is, is really special. But th- this, as an episode, as a guest, it, it, it's just, he, Chris Bart Williams is such a positive, happy man. You can't help but be made to feel better about life within yeah, a minute of, those... of being in his company. He's one of those people, isn't he, whose company you leave and you, your face is aching from smiling permanently. He's just in such a good mood. Now, we should let you know, this was re- <laughs> recorded over two days. We recorded a bit on one day and then basically because I used the cheap version of Zoom, the link timed out and then we had to pick up with him the following day. Chris lives in Miami. He's a football coach over there. And so on the second day, there's a bit of wind in the background because you should be able to tell him, we do talk about this, he's on his way to Fort Lauderdale Beach. He leads an amazing life out there in America. And we do talk a little bit about that. But his memories of Forrest, his stories about other players, his memories of his time in Nottingham. And he he sort of, we don't make the connection on the podcast, but he says he doesn't drink. And you can see that because his memories are so clear. Yeah, you, you really tell the you can really tell the difference, can't you? I mean, where we how I've remembered anything, I don't know. It, well, it, I haven't, it, I haven't this is a every guest brings their own experience, personality, energy, whatever you want to call it. And every episode has a different tone. And some of these are more reflective. Some of them go back a lot further, depending on the era of the player. This is just an absolute hoot from start to finish. This is a really funny episode, and it's all because of Chris. Because he's just, I kind of, I'm going to miss him tomorrow when I'm not speaking to him. <laughs> yeah. He's just, I mean, <sighs> walk, walking walking there, and specifically in the second ep- episode, in the second part of it today, um, just seeing all, all the Miami uh, architecture in the background and that, that gorgeous blue sky, and then he gets to the beach with his dogs and turns it around. I mean, it's, it's sickening. Number one, seeing as I'm sat here in Long Eaton. But he's just so effervescent, isn't he? Just yeah. just permanently bubbling. Just just such a joy. And, and by the way, he was exactly the same in the dressing room. When he when he came to Forest, he was just an instant burst of enthusiasm and talent and joy and uh, what an exciting player, but what a great lad. What a what a what a privilege to know. Amazing. And there are stories on this podcast I'd never heard before. So this one about his TV appearance. Um, <laughs> we address some um, potential urban myths, or are they true, about his foot size <laughs> and footwear and how he wore them and why he wore them in a particular way. So listen out for that. But just in general, this is, I mean, it's almost beyond football or forest this. This is just an hour in the company or 40 odd minutes, however long in the company just of a really charismatic, positive, happy soul. And you, at the end of this episode, you're just going to feel better about life. <laughs> what, what a great gift that is. Um, we should thank, by the way, Mr. Dor, Dor on tour, the YouTuber, great forest YouTuber, friend of the show. He puts in touch with Chris. And we should thank uh, Rich Fisher as well, who puts in touch with Brian Rice. So if you know a Forest player that would like to come on the show, obviously we approach people. It's fairly ad hoc. It's just me and Paul texting people, really, and some players get in touch with us. Um, and we have to get in touch with others. We know a lot of ex-players listen to this. So if you're sat there as a former Forest player at any level, and you, come you, you on. could be the youth team player, it, you don't have to have played for the first team. They've or if you're involved the most, in the most interesting ones, haven't they? Well, that's it. The Craig Armstrong episode is a classic. Sean Deitch never played for the first team. That His episode was superb. Um, but if you worked in the commercial department or the club shop or the ticket office, if you're involved in Forest in any oh, way... Oh, don't say that. They'll all come out the woodwork. <laughs> <laughs> you can still vet people. Well, but get in touch. Yeah, okay. RRD. Yeah. Getting in touch doesn't guarantee an appearance unless you play. <laughs> but email us, rrd1865 at outlook.com. Uh, thank you for all of you. I mean, the Twitter reaction to this, even before it was put up, was sensational. Uh, people really excited as we were to hear from Chris Bart Williams. So I'm going to shut up and hand over to just uh, an absolute ray of sunshine. Where are you? 
<laughs> I'm in Miami. Oh, the dream. Chris, dream. I, didn't, I, I didn't appreciate when we asked you to do this. So it's, it's two o'clock UK time. What time is it over in Miami? Hold on a minute. It's, it's 10, 10, 10 o'clock. Okay, so that's not too bad. It's not like 6 a.m. Yes. Yeah, that's what I got confused. I thought it was two o'clock my time. Then I realised, hold on a minute, it's not my time. <laughs> well, that's our fault. So sorry, sorry for getting you out of bed. <laughs> Don't worry, it's all good. It's all good. Uh, the weather there, I, I thought Miami might look a bit sunnier, but the, it looks a bit uh, overcast. Oh, so this is our uh, still part of our winter season. So what happens is it's overcast, and then by noon, it's 92. Oh, lovely. Oh. It's still, it will, it's still, it's seventy five right now. It will, it will be almost as wow. sunny and warm as that beautiful day when you signed with Kevin Campbell and those, those, <laughs> those <laughs> glorious. So, when I think of the summer, I think 40. of you and Kevin Campbell holding those forest shirts. <laughs> <laughs> that made a lot of uh, shuffle people mad that day for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Forty, have you pressed play yet? Yeah, you I've pressed record. Was... Oh, I know what I'm doing, mate. I've are, we do, are we on? Well, you know that little red dot in the corner of your screen. No, I, says no I haven't got one. All right, we're well, well recorded. There's Good the stuff. Magic. There's the magic gone. <laughs> <laughs> but that that day, Chris, when you first signed for Forest, and it, it was such an exciting day for Forest fans. Two big name players coming to Forest. That was a real sign that we were in the big time. The summer of 1995, and those beautiful photos of you and Kev Campbell on the pitch with those shirts. Um, when you first come into Forest, then what what were your first impressions of the club and of the stadium and everything? Uh, well, the stadium I was familiar with, but it was definitely unusual feeling because it's forest. And if I'm, if I recollect going back to my Orient days, I think Frank Clark tried to get me to sign with Forest under Cluffy. But the day that Cluffy came to watch me play Orient, I had a crappy game. So, <laughs> so you could have wow. signed for Forest under when Clough. I was sixteen. Yeah, when I was sixteen, and so the day. Again, the day um, I guess the, the Forest staff came to watch, I just had a really bad day, um, bad game that, that night. Um, hence, I got yelled at after the game. Deservedly so. <laughs> <laughs> Deservedly so. So, I think we played Sheffield Wednesday in the Cup two weeks later. And obviously playing them twice, they saw me and then they took me. So, that was, the, that was what, how I ended up at Sheffield and not Forest. But to sign for Forest that day was quite quite special because obviously Kevin, I spoke to Kevin, he was like, I'm going to Forest. I was like, okay, that makes my job easier. So <laughs> going to Forest um, was really exciting, but also very um, intimidating. Very intimidating. The history. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the playing style was different to Sheffield Wednesdays, um, which ended up taking me probably 18 months to get acclimated, which is why the fans didn't like me at first. But people don't realise it's a completely change of playing style yeah. and you don't you know good players can go to different clubs and they are good players just you still got to adapt to I had to adapt to the character attack which we didn't really do much at Forest I mean at Sheffield Wednesday our, our build up was very not slow but it was very patient okay um, which Forest which Forest can do but at the time the Forest team that I arrived at was very good at just character attacking hence Maka um, plays to his strength and why Dynamic, he did so wasn't well it? Okay, let, yeah. let's come on to some of that detail in a minute. But as you mentioned, Maka, Chris, do you remember the first time you clapped eyes on him? What, what was the first thing you thought when you met Paul McGregor? Clapped eyes on him. What? Uh, I was like, <laughs> okay, this guy is Go easy, character. Bart. Go easy. No, no first of all, <laughs> this guy's a character. But he was young, but wanting to learn. Um, he had a unique character, which senior pros don't always appreciate. Because he's quirky. <laughs> he was quirky. He was. But he was he was he was true to himself. That was what I liked. Ah, oh, thank uh, he you, was man. True to himself. You didn't change your character, or your dress code, or your you didn't change even when you got the first thing, which was great. So I got a lot of admiration for you, Maka. Uh, I appreciate you. that, brother. Because that's nice a tough one. dressing room, as you well it know. It was a tough dressing room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> tough in what way? Because of the personalities were so strong and so. Um, demanding and they wanted you to they wanted to find out what you're made of at the end of the day because if you change who you are they, they, they go after you but if you stand true to who you are which a lot of them did and so did Maka um, they respect you for that and I think it was rightly so why he had such a successful time because 
Maka was true to himself and nobody, everybody knew you couldn't change him. You couldn't mm. change him. And that's how you get respect from first team players. That is so cool to hear. I mean, Paul, I'm watching you beaming. That must be, that must be lovely to hear back years it is later. Lovely. Oh, it's absolutely lovely, yeah. Um, I think Bart was, it was exactly the same. Came in and him and Cam's were an entire, with just a breath of fresh air. Completely different attitude, um, different direction. Um, yeah. The dressing room brightened. Our side, our side of the dressing room, Bart, was just <laughs> you had all the old, all the old farts on that side, and then our side was just <laughs> with 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 red and, and, Scott and Scotty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it I just think erupted. You're right there. It was a different side of the dressing room, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> but it worked so well. It worked so well, didn't it? And we were the youngest side, and the older boys, the more established boys. Uh, really respected that, and they were glad for a younger team, for a younger side as well. Especially players like Bart, who was a, who uh, you know, to return the compliment is one of the best technicians I've ever played alongside. I had the privilege to play alongside. Thank you. Just um, for somebody that never tied the shoelaces up, by the way, <laughs> and bootlaces, always played in mouldies, no matter what the weather. Make people fall over when I tell them that. Uh, but two wonderful feet, and uh, like, and it. What shocked me, I can remember being a year or so in and realising you were my age, Bart. <laughs> yeah. But you'd, you'd been around forever and you'd been established and yeah. you had an older head on your shoulders and, uh, yeah, genuinely someone, like a peer that I'd looked up to and thought, Christ, you know, here's someone, so I, here's someone at the level I should be somewhere close to. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my favourite performance of yours was at Chef Wednesday. You that day, went to, <laughs> we had a young team out that day. Yeah. Um, and I remember um, my girlfriend at the time was like, are you nervous about this game? Because it's my first game back. And I said, yeah, it's going to be a, it's going to be a hell of a game, but we've got a young team out. But this young, these young players can play. Me and Bobby and started, remember, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. It was you. Um, it was, oh, my God. Just trying to think who was out front. The little Geordie. Bobby. 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 Yeah. Um, and you guys, oh my God. Even well, Bobby hit a volley, little... didn't he? Bobby yeah. hit a volley from outside of the box yeah. after about 20 minutes and it flew yeah. in. And mate, I was, I was stood there watching it going, I am not having that. I am not having him upstage me at any point. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it's a watch you guys play um, that day and that stage and what it meant to me. I remember Des Walker saying in the second half, you know, basically his, his team went, yeah, great. Let Chris come back and just run the game without freaking doing yeah, anything. Yeah. But yeah. it wasn't the fact I was running the game. It was the fact that you guys were just killing them with the character attack. Um, yeah. And that's when I knew that I was at two different clubs because she, and we knew how Sheffield Wednesday played, but it was just the fact that we just outpaced them and out used the strategy of character attack. But that yeah. game was one of the best games that I saw. And then obviously the goal that he scored in your eighth, the UA for um, <laughs> get us through. That was a that was a great night. That was yeah. a great night. It and was a great you night. deserve all the plug borders that day. Oh, well bro, nice one, Chris. I've got to ask you about your boots. Firstly, is it true you used to play with your laces undone? Correct. Why? <laughs> because uh, the top of my the top where you tie it used to. I used to get a lot of pain there. So when I found that you could tie it without coming off. I was good to go. Now, I got threatened by numerous managers that if it came off, there was going to be trouble. And ironically, no one ever stood in the back of my heels for it to come off. That was number one. And two, I guess I had, I had two pairs of socks, so it just never came off. <laughs> but you never tripped over your laces or anything like that? N nope. Nope. Never and on his backside in, mate. But years later, when you see Usain Bolt win the 100 metres with his laces undone... Part of me wonders whether he'd seen you do it first. <laughs> Def <laughs> definitely. <laughs> it's it's like putting on the slip. It's like putting on your slippers. That's how I felt putting on my boots. It really was like, oh, here's my match day slippers. Here they go. Legend. <laughs> but I think I really enjoyed winding up my managers. That's what I think I enjoyed more than anything else. <laughs> and is it true your boot size was si size five? It was size six and a half. Because that seems quite small. It's very small. And I'm a seven. 
Oh, right. So actually, yeah. it's not as strange as it sounds. I think, it, well, it's not, it's, yeah, I think there's more. Eight, eight and a half and plus is probably the norm. Sevens and six and a halves are really very infrequent. Unless you're like five foot four. Yeah. It's really, <laughs> it, it was unusual for say the least. Because for some reason, I expect footballers to have quite big feet. But I don't know why that is. Uh, no, that wasn't my case. I was I was the small feet gang. And were you the smallest? Um, I've got to be careful. <laughs> <I ask you>. <laughs> <laughs> were you the smallest boot size at Forest at the time? Was it commented on? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, it was occasionally. It was occasionally in uh, in both aspects. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So you said earlier about adapting to to Forrest's play and that. Now, and you said that it took the fans a while to warm to you. Now, I don't remember that, but but that's because I was a kid. And and as a fan, I just, you know, I just love anyone who's worn the shirt. So did, was the first season or two a bit difficult for you then? Did did you feel that the fans hadn't perhaps taken you in as much as you thought they might? Um, I wasn't expecting them to be, you know, this is great. But you have to win the fans over. You know, th- there's no getting around it. Um, I think Frank Clark had it right, which was there was more, more of me to give, but I was still trying to solve the, the, the problems that I was having on the field um, in the playing style uh, and the role that Frank wanted me to play. Um, so it just took some time to adapt because I spent my whole youth program, my youth development under Frank Clark, obviously, and then at Sheffield playing one way and now adapting to one that's wanted me to be hitting cross field balls, penetrating balls and keeping the ball ticking over. And it was just, um, it was a lot. And you had to win games and you had to learn your new teammates playing style. So it, it was really difficult when you have the same lineup and you change it, then I had to adapt to someone new playing. How do they play? Whereas at Sheffield, it took a year to get acclimated, but then after that, it's easy. So the same thing kind of happened at Forest. And how did um, how did Frank Clark handle it? it would he say, "Oh, come on, Chris, you know you got uh, you got to give it a macker, you know." <laughs> this is what was really unusual for me, which was the Frank Clark Forest was a different Frank Clark than Leighton Ory. In really, that's way. interesting. Yeah. How come? He was he was mild. The Frank Forest was fantastic. He was able to communicate with me very effectively, calmly. And I remember one game we weren't playing very well and he had a cup of tea in his hand and the fact that he didn't yell at us and didn't drop, spill a drop, I was like, who is this guy? <laughs> but at Orient, he was working with a different kind of caliber of player than at Forest. But I think he, you have to adapt to the environments that you're going to. Whereas at, at, at Laurier, even occasionally he let me have it. I was six, sometimes 15, 16. Um, he, he wasn't shy. I got it like the senior pros. And that was the one thing I got to say thank you to him for, which was when I got in the first team, he didn't treat me as a 16-year-old. It was, I got it as if I was a senior pro. And when a coach holds a play to that standard, you can't fail. No excuses. If I had a bad game, I had a bad game. There was no, it wasn't because I was young. It was, I had a bad game. That's it. And that, that would have been the reason why he came after you again, just because he knew you could handle that level of, uh, particularly at a young age, you've seen it from a young age, how you handle criticism, how you developed. Yep, he, that, the way they developed me at Orient, and not only myself, but the, the whole youth team, was um, was amazing. Because at 13, 14, we were playing against semi-professional teams. Yeah, We're getting the crap kicked out of us. Yeah. But the reason why, because they wanted us to develop to get in that first team as soon as possible. So once I got into Orient first team, I was really used to playing with men, against men. So it didn't seem anything different, if that makes sense. Yeah. So Orient had a, a real great strategy of development that was um, conducive to creating good players and accountable players. And that's one thing that I had throughout my career at Orient, which was when it was good, they told you it was good. And when it was bad, they told you it was bad. And then they showed you how to improve. And I think that was um, a big bonus of Frank. When Frank called me to say, hey, do you want to come to Forest? I was like, yeah. Because I knew he wasn't mm-hmm. going to take it easy on me. He wasn't going to go, oh, Chris, no, 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 no. He was going to he was going to put his foot up my butt if it needed it. <laughs> but he just did it in a very more calm manner when I 
met up with him at Forest again. And what a cool thing to happen. You, you know, you come through that development at Leighton Orient um, and with, the, you know, a big club Leighton Orient, but then you get the chance with the same guy years later and the summer in which you sign, Forrester just finished third in the Premier League. This is a club with a massive history. It feels like it's going places again. And this was like, everyone looks back on the 90s now. It was like the last time the country was happy. The sun was <laughs> like with Kevin Campbell. It must have felt fantastic. It did. Um, and Frank Clark, right off the bat, even before I signed, said, listen, you're behind. Um, you're not going to start. You're not going to start. Oh, yeah, he wow. told me. He said, you're not going to start. Went, okay. He says, uh, I, I'm rewarding the boys that got me here and so forth. I was like, that's fair. Which it is. Yeah. So I had to wait my time. And then um, uh, Philo got injured at, it was a way to, not Augsburg, uh, Malmo. And that's when I got my, my opportunity. So he was very candidly honest about where I, where I laid. I mean, that's mad because in the 90s, like you were a megastar in the 90s, like, even before you came to Forest. Like you were one of the most famous footballers in the country. Everyone had you on their bedroom wall. You make this big move. I know I you did. You <laughs> <laughs> what a night that was. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, the peak of your powers. You're one of the most famous players in the country and you're prepared to sign for Forrest and not star. I just think that sounds incredible. It sounds like good management. Um, yeah. it, it was just good management. It, it really was. Um, the staff at Forest uh, were well, just fantastic. Um, the only thing I didn't like was walking down Trent to the training ground. <laughs> that was a pain in the butt. Because it was just a pain in the butt. Like, I enjoy training very much. And uh, uh, obviously, at Wednesday, you literally get changed. You drive across the street and you're at the training ground. But this is like a 10 minute walk. Yeah. And when it was windy on that Trent, it was like, oh, come yeah. on, you're killing me here. <laughs> And for it's some the walk reason, back Monday, that's the killer. I know. The walk back was great. It was just a walk there, like, here we go. But um <laughs> but we had some pretty damn interesting times in that lock in that change room for sure. We had some unbelievable moments. So what, Bart you... Fordy always um always tells me that my skin's still looking good these days, right? And I always put it down to you. You and Cam's when you boys arrived. <laughs> Mr. Coco <laughs> butter up, head to toe. Um, oh, yeah. It used to smell so lovely. And I'd me and Scotty <laughs> be sat there. So me and Scotty got, got in fully into the cocoa butter. So to this, to, this, to this day, Bar, I thank you for my youthful complexion. I tell you what, you, do, you, you look good. That's what I'm saying. Like, you, you haven't lost anything. My goodness. <laughs> I'm, I'm hilarious. That's hilarious. Yeah. So thank are you, you. Are you still using it, Macca? Yes, absolutely, one hundred percent. I've just, no I've way. just, I've been for a run, had a shower, and just buttered up. This is this is twenty six years later, Chris. The effect you've had on his life. What a legacy! <laughs> <laughs> but mind you, you had some really good plays coming behind you. Um, if I'm not mistaken, like JJ, um, Andy Reid. Yeah, um, you had some good plays. I mean, they were a more successful been... batch as well. Yeah, I remember speaking to Andy Reid. He came up and asked me advice about what he should do, but he was going to get a very limited contract at Forest and he was exploring going elsewhere. And I remember saying to him, Andy, of all the clubs in the country that you should probably want to play for is either Crew or Forest, yeah. if you're trying to get in the first team. This club has a history of playing young players. Why would you go anywhere else? So, God bless him. He, he, he stayed at Forest and obviously got his opportunity. But, you know, it was, that said, we had a good batch of young players coming through. And the 90s, yeah. the, the period you were there sounds like the last era where players got perks, whether it was Ciro Soterio shirts or cars <laughs> or the McDonald's gold card. <laughs> Did you have a gold card? <laughs> I didn't. <clears throat> what? I wasn't. I, I should have. I That's appalling. <laughs> Everyone else had one, Chris. What, what I thought wrong? that was your. I thought that was your era, Bart. Did you not get it a gold was. card? <laughs> Did you not? Just didn't get one. Why? Were you just not there on the day they handed them out, or something? Uh, I, I'm normally like I just can't be bothered. Just, yeah. <laughs> what with free Mackie D's? Uh, no, yeah, we just. Uh, I'm very. I'm, some things haven't changed. I am very blasé about stuff like that. I'm just like, nah, I'm good. 
Well, that's probably the right attitude. But I, I mean, don't know if it's the right attitude. I just mean it might be laziness. I don't know. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm a good home cooked meal to McDonald's, you know. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, next time you're in Nottingham, we'll take you to McDonald's in West Bridgeford. <laughs> and uh, this podcast will get you a, a free McDonald's. <laughs> I, I, I will tell you this, if I ever, I'm not sure I'm going to come back to coach Faris or whatever, but one thing for sure, if you can coach in America, you can coach anywhere in the world. Oh, <laughs> really? Right now, <laughs> it's, it's a whole different experience than coaching in, what, in Europe. In what way? The things that you have to handle, whether you're coaching club, school, um, just all environments here, because you've got to manage everything, parents, um, it's just a, a, an experience that I have truly enjoyed, but I say that I stand by it, which is for a lot of pros, if you can coach here, um, I coach a little bit in South Italy, in Malta. Um, here's a whole different experience, whole different experience. And is that because you have to be a coach and a CEO and a ch it sounds like you're having to do everything all in one. You have to do everything, but more importantly, you have to break the game down to even smaller fragments because it's American kids. Right. Uh, do, you think it, do you think it's because it's not, it's not, they, they don't grow up kicking a ball against the wall and, and being out on the street all the time. It's not in their blood. Correct. And here they have multiple sports that they can play. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> if you have a successful player here, it means they've gone through literally the fun. When I talk about fundamentals of coaching, I'm basically a teacher and I've got to explain it in an academic way at times to my students because they relate to that and then change it into what it means to play football. Gosh. So, you know, it's, it's why when you're then talking to players who are established, you're probably going to be a good communicator because you can explain it in multiple uh, ways. Because here I have to explain it to multiple ways to both genders, both girls and boys. Such a so when point. I coach girls, I explain the same point in three different ways. <laughs> and, and, and do, you, have, do you teach the kids how to nutmeg each other? I teach that too. <laughs> that is a topic. That is a topic. <laughs> and, and do you teach them to say Megs when you've done it? <laughs> they, listen, you don't need any more encouragement to take, make fun of my accent. So, that's, that, <laughs> but they are, they are, they are. It is something very, very different, especially you know, coaching girls. If you can coach girls, you, again, it helps you with the the biggest issue for managers is communicate to their players and the the best two communicators i thought were dave bassett and david platt those two were very good communicators so a lot um, of the platt side uh, 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 that we've had on this show have, have really talked about how fantastic platt was and i think the fans you know the platt era is maligned and yeah, the, it's yeah. not looked back and well every player we've had on who played under platt raves about him the year he left that's that summer he left I was devastated. Oh man. You felt that that was the, we were, going, we were going to go back. It's like it all came to, especially that preseason tour, everybody pretty much came back in great shape. It felt the same kind of energy you had when we went up previously. It was the same kind of chemistry. And when he said he's going to go coach the 21s, I was like, oh my God, no. It's like the worst time. So the fans didn't get to see the best of David, but as players, I'm telling you, he was underrated. And I thought he was going to go on to be the first team manager. Um, that's how good he is. And at um, times, his his coaching was a bit too advanced for the level of players that we had. Wow. If that makes that's sense. Don't so disrespect to the players, seen. just that so, he was... So what was he doing that was ahead of his time then? Just the way he wanted us to play um, and the way he communicated it and the thought process and the philosophy was very in line with Forrest. But it had that that killer aspect of this is how you beat teams when we're not playing well in periods of game. It, it's just, he was very thorough. Uh, the one, so, I think what, so the ahead, problem then... The, trouble was, yeah, yeah um, that's what I was going to ask. The, the, it was very difficult for the Italians guy. It's not about blame. It's that it was difficult for the Italian guys to adjust to Forest and the culture of living in now Nottingham. It's different if it was London. Um, we had about four or five players come, came in that summer. It was just a hard adjustment um, that his first summer. So the fans didn't really get to see the best of how he played. And also he was trying to figure out where to play me. That was also a, 
a problem because he had me at centre mid, left centre back, <clears throat> right pushed on fullback. It was just sweeper. Yeah, yeah, sweeper. So it was it was it was really hard for for him to to kind of figure out what he wants to do with me. But we had a nucleus. We certainly did. And as for you know the Italian players coming over and how it would be different for them living in London than it would be for living in Nottingham. Did you enjoy living in Nottingham? And whereabouts were you based when you played for Forest? So first, when I first moved, I was in Scarrington, and then I got a place in the park. Lovely. And then I got a place um, out in Ashby de Zouche. Oh, very nice. So a bit of a commute I needed, because I needed a space to get away from the Nottingham lifestyle. <laughs> but when I need to stay in Nottingham, I stayed in the park. So that, that was the, it was that it was all about balance. Um, <laughs> the park is beautiful. <laughs> Paul, you were in the park for a bit. He I was, was in yeah. the park. Yeah, I was Tat- yes. Tattershall Drive. Yeah. That was that was so, yeah, bad. <laughs> you do need your privacy. You know, I'm, I value the privacy. Maybe so, that's where it all went wrong. I just stayed yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, because you're walking distance of trouble. Yeah. Oh man. That's, yeah. That should do it, Paul. <laughs> yeah. I also in in that house, my first house, it was like it was mad. It was like this Bond villain house. It's all open plan, and it, I inherited um, an enormous waterbed and a jacuzzi. Oh my god. <laughs> I know. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> Cry. <laughs> Cry. That's what you're going to do. You can have a bit of fun with it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so the Nottingham nightlife then, as with a lot of places, you know, Nottingham was absolutely rocking back then. So what were your favourite haunts, Chris? Oh, my goodness me. Let's see if I can remember. Uh, you know what? I was a follow the crowd guy, to be honest with you, because I didn't drink. So I was the, the, the kitty man or the taxi for those who need to go home safely back to certain partners. <laughs> You're basically like the best man for every, every weekend. <laughs> you used to go to Faces quite a bit, didn't you? Yeah, that was the only place we could go, I think, Faces, yeah. That was, that was a fun place. I love the decor yeah. there. We have some interesting <laughs> places. <laughs> if I remember rightly, um, one of the Christmas... Uh, parties that we had, I chose us to dress up as women. Is that right? That was right, you, yes. You did, yes. Yeah, I went to Tina Turner. Who else not happy with that one? So they had to go celebrity women. So who else did people dress up as, as? as? As transvestite or celebrity women, yeah. It just adds, so we had some, uh, I think Andy Johnson, went, no, Andy Johnson went as a, a, a nun, like a sexy nun or something ridiculous. Yeah, some of the fans' faces was like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> <laughs> was so there bad. were so many characters there. In the time that you were at Forest, from the yeah. from when you first come in in 95, and you, you say about the amazing times you had in that dressing room, obviously you had some amazing times on the pitch as well. But just thinking about some of the characters that were there at the same time as you, who, who are the people that really stick out? So <laughs> Kevin Campbell's obviously. Um, hmm. He's the... <laughs> Jason Lee used to make me live laugh because he was so, um, you couldn't get him rattled. No love, no money. Could you get that man rattled? <laughs> no, you just couldn't. Um, Stuart Pierce had his quirky personality, which was a bit cynical at times, <laughs> but all, all needed in the dressing room. Yeah. Um, and then you had Des Little <laughs> and Scotty Gemmel. Didn't say much, but when Scotty spoke, it had the impact. I think he would have been a good, like, Prime Minister. <laughs> Scott, he would have doing, made a, he's doing well he in coaching, made, isn't he? Yes. Making you know, a good Scott, name for himself. Made, yeah. Yeah. You know what, it's uh, so uh, odd that you say that, Chris, because one of the questions I was going to ask you later was which ex-Forest teammate would make the best Prime Minister? And I've never asked that to any <laughs> other guest before. For me, Scott Gemmell. Yeah. Isn't that he interesting is, that that came to yeah, mind? He's super smart. He's very observant. He's very aware of people and their thoughts. And that makes him, for me, why well, I would say that. So when you said like, there was like your side of the changing room and the old farts, who was in the old farts brigade? Oh, that's easy. That was like, uh, Mark Crossley was over there, Stuart Pierce, <laughs> Colin Cooper was on that side. Oh, and Steve Chet. Well, oh, Chet's Chet. in the middle. Chet was kind of on that side, but he was... Yes, he was centre right, wasn't he? He was centre, but he was up on that <laughs> side, yes. <laughs> <laughs> And they best have ended up over there too. Yeah. <laughs> we kicked them all over, didn't we? <laughs> Get it! Get it! 
that was definitely the old side. Yep, for yeah. sure. So then, who was on your side? Uh, we had we had what did we had? Desi, Scotty, Chrissy Allen, Chrissy Allen, Kevin, um, Jason Lee. Yeah, it was yeah, it was like it was bad on our side of the field. Our side of the room. <laughs> 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 just stinking of cocoa butter. Yeah, just... <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's talk about some of the on the pitch stuff because sure. a lot of people, firstly, we've had so many brilliant guests on this show. We've never had so many messages as when we announced you were coming on. Just so many tweets and, and really? emails. And the goal, so many, we had messages about so many goals, but the goal against Reading that effectively seals our promotion back to the Premier League. It, it, I mean, I remember it really clearly. Clearly, thousands of other Forest fans do as well. Do you still remember that bright, sunny day? I do. I remember we were having a real difficult day. We weren't playing well at all. Um, and Reading were, was the reason why we were struggling to kind of get any kind of rhythm. And I remember at half time, there wasn't any panic or fear. There wasn't any of that. But it was a case of we knew we just needed an opportunity. But then... As always, adverse, adversity hits, and then I think Kevin Campbell went off. Um, so Harry decided to put me back up up top. So not that I was that effective <laughs> during the game because we weren't playing that well. But I just remember the free kick, and I just wanted Coops to put it down the middle. Um, so when I saw the ball in towards me, I could see that whoever was in front of me, I think it might have been John Helder and a, a defender, they, they were going to miss the ball. I saw the flight of the ball. So I remember back as it goes back to my Orient days, that same situation where the ball came into me and I knew that I had practiced how to turn after my first touch. And then it was about deciding what the defender was going to do. So, yeah, it's something that had kind of happened before. Some... It was that a great goal. Touch was oh, beautiful, first mate. Touch, fantastic. First touch Which... was amazing because it, it, you should never have been allowed to turn there, should Correct. you? But the first, the first touch was so tight. You could see the defender going, do I, do I, do I, do I jump Correct. in here or not? And you just kind of faced him up so quickly. and was like, what? Yes. And then he so had to make his move, didn't he? The second Correct. he made his move, he was over. He was dead. So that's exactly how it is. So I knew that if he, if he touched me, I was going to go down. Yeah. That was number one. I knew if he came tight, I was going to go down and try and get the PK. But, it, but allowing me to turn, um, that's when it was, for me, I knew that I had to lift the ball over his right foot. Yeah. Um, because defenders always dive in. They just they just stick that leg out, and you just got to make sure it either goes through their legs or over their foot. And um, fortunately, that's where it helps to have two feet. So yeah. I put it in the corner. But yeah, that 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 goal was a was probably one of the most exciting moments I've ever had because I knew what came with it. Um, meaning, yeah. it people's jobs at Forest relied upon on us getting back to the Premiership. Um, so a greater responsibility fell on, on, on our shoulders as players that sometimes we forget that people's jobs rely on how we play. Um, and we have pressure on us. I mean, the, the, the staff were asking at the beginning of the season, were we going to get promoted? And I said right off the bat, I went, yes. And they were like, how are you so confident? I went, it's hard to explain, but we went to ups and downs, but it was more ups. But we just had a, we had a premiership team playing in Division One. That's essentially what we had. And that was a huge advantage. It was a phenomenal side. And, and that season, really, the, the last time we got promoted to the Premier League was absolutely brilliant. I remember the games towards the end of the season, beating Middlesbrough 4-0 at home. Like Some yeah. of the games were just absolute, And the city ground was rocking. Really, it was yes. the, like the last time it really felt like everything came together. And obviously, it was and, the, the last promotion to the Premier League. And the, the thing is, it was, it was Harry... We had some trepidations about Harry coaching us. I mean, coming in as manager. But he was brilliant. I mean, he, he didn't coach us. He was left it to his staff. He just managed us. Um, but he created an environment where he allowed us to play freely um, and in the manner that Forest fans like, which was one of our worries, which was, was he going to have us play long balls like Sheffield United, which I didn't want to be part of that. But the fact that he embraced the Forest culture um, was brilliant. He, he, made it, he made it easy to play. Now, years later, in 2000. 2001, your Forest's player of the season, you scored 15 goals. That is six summers after your first signed. It's, it's amazing that, it, it, obviously, I, I just thought you were fantastic every time you played for Forest anyway, but it felt like it really clicked at that point for you at Forest. 
What all came together that season? It, it was because, uh, that is so funny. It's because I felt accountable and responsible for the team. Um, I was, I just felt responsible. So I took on more responsibility to, to work on my free kicks, to, to just be more vocal. Um, so I think it was, that's what fed into place. Uh, I think I was playing mostly centre back that year, but I was just thinking more free kicks than PKs, but I just felt that I had a bigger role because when I, when we had Pierre there and Kevin there, we all shared the responsibility because that's what you do. But we did have a kind of a young side um, and I felt that I, I was compelled to use my experience that I had to help the team. So that's what kind of came together. And obviously, as you say, you'd had Frank Clark coach you and manage you at Leighton Orient. At Sheffield Wednesday, you'd been there under Trevor Francis and alongside Viv Anderson. So there'd yep. always been a kind of, I mean, obviously, I, I get you were playing with people who play for all different clubs as well. You could probably sure. find Forrest through every part of history. But to be with two Forest icons at Sheffield Wednesday, I wonder if that helped in some way. It did. Um, the, even the pros at Orient were, were fantastic my time at Orient. But to, so at Sheffield Wednesday, I was sat next to Viv. I got changed next to Viv mm -hmm. for my first year. And then he kicked me to the other side of the change room because I was annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. You literally get him over there. Because the first thing he said to me, he goes, you're the worst dresser I've ever seen. <laughs> what? <laughs> and I was like, I'm in my mind, I'm going, uh, first of all, you're like 100 years old and dressed like a black white man. And you're saying, I don't have dress. <laughs> but, you know, you've got to respect Viv. So I had him on one. Oh, so it's worse. I had him on one side and Nigel Jemson to the other side of me. Oh, man. So you've got two boys <laughs> players, either side of me and Trevor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was, Forrest was everywhere, everywhere in, in that dressing room. <laughs> so, and then when Des Walker arrived, can you, I mean, it was just insane. Yeah, that's amazing. But, it was like a sort of Forest Vets team. It was, it was. Um, I, I think the, one of the funniest moments I had was when we played forest at Sheffield Wednesday and I was late getting out the, the change room and I was going down the tunnel which was pretty small Sheffield Wednesday and I said and I go down the tunnel and I said excuse me Mr. Clough because I was trying to get past him to run out on the field and he turned around and went hey son and he he whacks me on my shin he kicks me yeah Brian Clough <laughs> kicks me he goes hey son none of my players have kicked you so I thought I better have kicked you <laughs> 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 like, okay, and that was my introduction to Brian Clough. No, really? It was absolutely hilarious. So, would you be really upset if I told you the beach is about five minutes walk from my house? Yes, yes, we yeah, would. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Man. yeah, not yeah. that I need a tan. Not that I need a tan at all, but still. <laughs> well, just for listeners of the show, we can now see you on the way to the beach. So, are you going to the beach for leisure? Are you going to the beach for leisure or for work? Um, no, uh, complete leisure. I'm taking my dog out. Hold on a minute. There is the idiot. Show us, show us what you got. Oh, let's see this idiot. We'll describe him for, for people on the you podcast. Oh, what a beauty. Boxer, a boxer like a, dog. Yeah, like a boxer. Yeah. There's, there's three of them. And what are, what they, are they called? called? Oh, uh, there's an echo. I've got, I've got a white one called Bond. That's my James Bond girl. <laughs> um, this one's called Numpty. Nice. Like his dad. <laughs> and the other one's called Brooklyn. So, yeah, there's three of them. Uh, trouble. <laughs> I was I was hoping one of them might have a forest name, like you might have Kev, Pierre, and Stan or something like that. <laughs> nah, I don't think so. I don't need reminders. <laughs> Psycho the poodle. <laughs> <laughs> reminders of bad behaviour. <laughs> yeah. Talk about dogs. <laughs> we had um, we had a lot of emails. Tweets, messages when we heard when people heard you were coming on. So we got we got some here um, from from listeners. Giles said, "What went on with Nigel Doughty refusing the manager to play him at the same time as refusing him a new contract? Is that true?" I didn't go off on a new contract, and I, did, I told, I, told I, was, I wasn't allowed to play. It was it was the most bizarre thing I've ever I think I've ever experienced in my career, which was even when Oran Axon didn't play me. That was bizarre, but it was his choice. This was crazy, which was, I was basically sitting at home, being paid a lot of money to not do anything. <laughs> Sounds is great. Counter, which is counter to what the fans exactly want. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like an, it's like an early version of furlough. <laughs> dear fans, I can say it's any players, dear fans, do you mind if I stay at home and 
get paid a lot of money and not do anything. Best wishes, Chris. I mean, it was crazy. It was crazy. The phone call that I got that night from my agent, he was laughing on the phone to me. He says, you're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you. I'm like, okay. He goes, yeah, you can't play anymore. I was like, what? He goes, yeah, you're done. They won't play wow. you because you won't, because you won't leave. He goes, and that was it. I was like, okay. But that was it. Absolutely bonkers. Crazy. I mean, this is all the stuff. This is all the stuff people don't hear about. Fans don't hear, do they? Part of the life of a footballer. They don't know this stuff. Right. They don't realize this, the, the things that are going off, off the field that do impact you on the field. Um, but it was a it was just bizarre because they got rid of Andy Johnson, they were trying to get rid of Adam Rogers. I was next on the hit list to bring the young players through. Listen, I get that. That uh, the future makes sense. But in Division One, that team was just way too young to get out of Division One without experienced players. Yeah. It was like the most craziest plan ever. So, so what, it, what did you do then? Did, did you just sit at home? Were there any books you read or <laughs> that yeah. night I did. Books you watched? <laughs> <laughs> that night I did. But um so I would always go to training, but the problem is my week was basically Monday to Friday. And that was it. So I, I did training at home um on Saturdays and Sundays, but pretty much I was just training with reserve players. Oh mate, life as a footballer though, with no when you when you know you've got no end product is the most meaningless existence, isn't it? It was a, it was, it was a long, I think it was like, ooh. Yeah, it is. It really is. You're bored out of your head because you've got nothing to look forward to. Yeah. Um, Training has you know, no point other than fitness. It has no point. And you can try work hard with the younger, younger players, which is fine. But your own self-motivation was hard. But I knew I had to stay in, stay in shape because there's another chapter around the corner. I just knew. So um, I was actually in not the city center of Nottingham, and I got a phone call from my agent, and I was just about to have friends dinner with my friends, and who I hadn't seen for like between five and ten years. And literally walking in, and I got the call. It says, "Hey, Chris, go home and pack. pack. You're going to Charlton. You need to be here tonight at the hotel." And this was at nine o'clock, so. I had to say goodbye and go home. Oh, man. It's not being evicted from the Big Brother house. It, is. it really was. It really was. Um, and the next morning, I was training at Charlton. And, it, wow. and that's when it didn't make sense. It's one thing if they think you're too old, you're not good enough, and you end up, you know, down the league. But to end up at Charlton was like, this is stupid. <laughs> this, is, this is stupid. What a so, sad end. It, it was. So, um, Anna Kerbishy was like, Great, I'll, I'll take you. Um, <laughs> he must have been chuffed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I didn't think I was a particular analyst courtesy kind of signing, but um, it was just it was just strange the fact that you don't want someone to play, you want them to leave, and you end up shipping them off to uh, to Charlton. That's just bad bad politics. Yeah, and optics. We had an email off a guy called Jim. He says, one of my lasting memories of the Bartman was him appearing on Channel 5's karaoke show, Night Fever. How did that come about? <laughs> okay. That <laughs> story I've told only a few people here in the States. And not that they, they kind of understood the, the, the gravity, but they really didn't understand the gravity. <laughs> I, my agent said, do you want to do Night Fever? I was like... Yeah, why not? He goes, Chris, you can't sing. <laughs> yeah, so what? Let's go do it. So <laughs> it was after. <laughs> so one Saturday after um, a game, they picked me up in Nottingham, took me down to London. I mistakenly went out, got back to my hotel at like three o'clock in the morning, and the car for the show picked me up at about eight. I went to the studios, and here's where it got really interesting. Get to the studios, and. We're going to the green room and all the celebrities from the show are in the green room. And the, real, the, the realism kind of hit me then. I'm like, what have I done? And now I'm tired, <laughs> croaky voice. <laughs> now, thankfully didn't drink that night. And I'm there with the, <laughs> these celebrities. And so the lady, the producer comes over and says, hey, um, we're going to do a acapella run in the green room. <gasps> then we're going to go to the studio and record. Huh, interesting. Oh, mate, I'm nervous for you already. You should be. It got worse. <laughs> <laughs> it, got, it got very worse. 
<laughs> so then the producer's like, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna have Sarg do this and that, and then and then we're gonna get the young lady from Sister from Sister Sledge, you're singing song number two. Oh. And then Chris, you're gonna do your song. I'm like, now I'm crying. Because we <laughs> had to do it, I had to sing it in the green room a cappella with all the celebrities in the room. No. What I mean, I was horrendous, it wasn't even funny. <laughs> And I had to sing Phil Collins, You Can't Hurry Love. Of course you did. <laughs> what I mean, I, I I was crying. I was crying. I had to have coffee after coffee. Yeah. <laughs> and literally an hour later, got changed and into the studios. Have you got oh, have boy. you got a little blast for us now? <laughs> <laughs> Is this is this a sucky view? Oh, B A B. Oh, Chris is now at the beach. Oh, look at that, Miami Beach. Sorry, mate. Sorry. But this is quiet. So I'm oh, actually wow. in Fort Lauderdale at the moment. God, it's Fort Lauderdale gorgeous. at the end of the. Oh, wait, <laughs> yeah, it's different from Miami Beach. Miami Beach is Miami Beach, so I'm just gonna have a seat up here. Wow. My dog. This is yeah, so, so um, surreal. Talking to Chris Park Williams studio. live from Miami, who's remembering <laughs> singing a cappella Phil Collins songs in front of Suggs on Channel 5. And Gloria Gaynor. Was it Gloria Gaynor? Who was it? Sister Sledge. <laughs> Sister Sledge. Oh, sorry. It's Phil Collins. Sister Sledge, yeah. So then um, I went to the studio. The first... The first take wasn't very good. The, the producer was like, cut, cut, cut. And I'm like, oh, my God. The second, take, the, second take, the second take was cut, cut, cut. And then the third take, he just let me, he just let me go. He just let me go. He's like, <laughs> You're like, get him on the same deal as that forest. Pay him not to yeah. sing. <laughs> <Yeah>. Shepherd's <laughs> crook. Pay him to do nothing. He's great at that. <laughs> After the show, the other step was like, you have balls to have done this show. I'm like, yeah. let's just say people thought, well, of course he did. Of course I he did. I love that. I loved that program. It's Channel 5. Suggs hosted it, didn't he? And it was Linda Lou Sardi and her husband yep. Sam from Brookside. And it was like the Correct. boys' team and the girls' team. Yep. Peter Kay used to be on it. Yep. Who was yep. on the episode yep. you did? Oh, I'm trying to think. I, I, don't, I can't even remember because it was a blur because I was so tired. I went back to the hotel and slept. I was so tired. <laughs> it was so hot in the studio. And I ended up dancing and wiggling my butt, like one of my celebrations. It was a lot of me. It wasn't pretty. It wasn't, it wasn't pretty. <laughs> oh, right. If anyone remember, can find video footage of this, they need to email it in. <laughs> yeah, please and the do. Worst thing is, the worst thing is we had a game. It was like two months later, we had a game. And Platy was like, after the game, instead of talking about the game, Platy was like, everybody go home. Chris is on night fever. You've got to see this. And I turned off my phone. I, it out. <laughs> I, went, I went ghost. And then, uh, and then on Monday, yeah, I got ripped a new one. So, oh, yeah, that man. went down. That is so cool. Um, <laughs> we we end each show by asking you the sort of questions you used to get asked in football magazines in the nineties. The sort of oh, Ford, forty forty. Yeah. Sorry, can can I just interrupt you there? Yeah, I've been I've actually been sent a list from a friend of mine, Dave Marples. Actually, been sent a list when he knew Bartman was coming on of those types of questions that you used to get asked in match and all that kind of stuff, but okay. from back in the day. So Bart's actually pre-answered all of these. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the questions this time. Yes. <laughs> and see see if you can see if you can actually remember what you answered to these bizarre questions. Oh, that is brilliant. This, this is, be ugly. is yeah. Th I mean, this is from goodness. Uh, uh, I think it's just about two thousand or something. And do you know what magazine anyway. it's from? Um, it's actually the Guardian. Do you remember the interview, Bart? I don't. But Brilliant. Well, ahead. that's perfect. Wow. So, be high, some of your right? answers are genius, might, might I add, to the point where I don't even know where you're taking the Mickey or <laughs> whether they're real. <laughs> Here we go. Then I'll run. I'll race through them. But what's your idea of perfect happiness? Can you remember? I definitely can't remember. Was it something to do with food? You put going on holiday permanently. <laughs> that sounds like me. <laughs> Mate, it is you. You're live from Fort Lauderdale Beach. <laughs> it's Next one. Next one. This is great. What's your greatest fear? 
my greatest. Oh, I'm playing bad football. No, tell me. What did I say? <laughs> Being tortured for information that I don't have. <laughs> 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 oh my god, it's so good. Uh, what about this one? What is the trait you most deplore in yourself? Oh my, tell me. Tell Lack me. of compassion. Yeah, you know what? I've actually really? got better at that. I've actually got better at that. I should have known that one. <laughs> and the trait you most deplore in others? Oh, indecisive people. There you go, indecision. Oh, you got brilliant. one. Brilliant. What vehicles do you own? Oh my God, how old was I now? About 2000. 2000, so I'm at Forest. If you've got one, if you've yeah, ever yeah. owned one of these, you go up in my estimations, it's either, even more so. It's like 2000, it's either a Range Rover, <laughs> Aston Martin. Oh, behave yourself. No, it's a Morris Minor. Oh yeah, that's what I was taking a piss. Completely <laughs> <laughs> different car. That's what I was definitely taking a piss. Told them that. My my neighbourhood where I grew up had a lot of those. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what is your what is your greatest regret? Back then, I couldn't even tell you right now. Come on, tell me. Not not being around in the sixties. <laughs> Ooh, yes, yeah. <laughs> Some I'm of those, slightly uh, out of your hands, Chris. <laughs> I, I know, but I, I, I love the old rock and roll music from back in the 60s. I'm yeah, again, right. checking the hips. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, oh, my God. Got, I mean, it gets a bit racy now. How often do you have sex? I, I might have said I'm lucky to even get it, so... <laughs> you put too often in my dreams, which is quite interesting, <laughs> really. That should have been more making love. Um, it's one of the few answers that hasn't changed. Um, <laughs> yeah. Make, making love before 25 just didn't happen, all right? Just so we clear. Yeah, all right, all right. Well, um, and we'll, we'll end on, which is, which is a very good motto, actually. What would your motto be? I'm all about living freely. Tell me. Tell me what I said when I was... Always wear a good pair of shoes. That is a that is a good motto. It's decent, to be fair, isn't it? That's, that's a good motto. Yeah. Yeah. That, that actually, thank you for reminding me of that. Oh my goodness, I would never remember those answers. Well, this will I say would... a lot about you. The very final one. How would you like to die? With a smile on my face is probably my answer. No, no. Saving saving somebody else's life. Oof, that was I think decent. that says a lot about you, mate. You know, in good shoes. Thank what more do you want? <laughs> Ricky my proudest. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I completely forgot. This is the best one. Do you believe in life after death to remain uh, deep? You put yes, because I believe in Casper, the friendly ghost. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure you're taking this question as seriously, boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my word. <laughs> Oh my god, yep. That's the bad side of me, I think. <laughs> they are sensational. We need to ask every guest those questions from now on. <laughs> Chris, this has been such an absolute pleasure. You are the happiest guest we've ever had on. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Back it's, it's great to see you. Oh, oh, it's mate, such a joy, man. And thank you for your kind words. And when the uh, market yeah, turns, do. hopefully we'll see you over here in the UK one day. I'll be I'll be coming over once the pandemic's over. I'm gonna bring my team over. I'm gonna ask for us to see if we can play. They're probably Beautiful. saying no, but it's still still I wanna pop over and make sure I'll let you guys know when I'm coming over. That'd be amazing. We'll see you in Nottingham Brilliant, sometime mate. soon. Sounds Stay good. safe, bro. Loads Cheers, of love. Bart, man. See you later, guys. Top man, mate. Right. Nice Bye. One. Oh man, you know, for a brief moment there, Paul, I felt like we were on the beach with him. Oh, I really felt like I was. Feel the warmth the on the back, on your back, couldn't you? <laughs> feel the warmth on your back. And for the first time ever, it wasn't just me. No, so the, the second <laughs> bit of the podcast that we, we recorded most of it yesterday, and then that last bit where you can probably you could probably hear a bit of wind on it. But during lockdown, you know, we're we're all having to make podcasts and listen to podcasts that perhaps the sound is compromised a little bit. He was walking. 
They're just saying hello to people in the street while we're recording with him. <laughs> hello, mate. Hello, mate. Walking his dog. And then when he gets to the beach and he spins the phone round, you're like, crystal clear blue water. Oh. Shimmery, you know, perfect blue sky, golden sands. An empty beach as well. I mean, that's a joy, isn't it? Nothing worse than a full beach. Oh, well, that, I mean, particularly now, you know, that would just make me really nervous. Yeah. Uh, but Bartman, just absolutely living the dream. What a boy. What a boy. And thank you. Thank you for your emails because those, the two, and we got loads, obviously. And some of the questions that people suggested were things we were going to ask anyway and did. So, so that's why we chose some of those. But Jim, for asking about Saturday Night Fever, I didn't know about that. And uh, um, the question from uh, Andrew, um, oh no, who was it? Giles, sorry, about, about his contract were two really good questions. So do always, when you see that we've announced a guest, do always drop us a line because some of those questions are really good and they're sometimes stuff we haven't heard about or, or didn't know. So email the show with anything you like, rrd1865 at outlook.com. Follow us on Twitter at rrd1865. And please leave a review on iTunes if you listen to this on there because it just helps us get up the charts, helps other Forest fans find it. We're going to try and keep making a few of these uh, to keep people entertained during these difficult days. The How pipeline's are you doing, filling up, isn't it? It is. We, the thing is, you know what? I never want to jinx things. So we do have a couple of guests booked that are really <laughs> exciting. Yeah. Really um, who people have requested a few times. I mean, basically every guest we get on, someone has requested because they're an ex-Forest player who's alive. So, you know, <laughs> depending on what generation you are, you can take it as read that someone, at least one person has got in touch at some point, but we've got a couple of great ones lined up. And people who've agreed to come on the show might be easier for some people once we're back in the studio. Uh, and therefore back in the six barrels, which is now taking on oh. like a sort of mythical step. I've never thought about the Bring six barrels so much. Come on. I know, I know. Can I just say, I, I really like your hair like that, Matt. You, do you know who you look like? You reminded me of today. Oh, go on. Jim Kerr. Oh, from Simple Minds? Yeah. Oh, I'll take got bit, that. Got a bit of Jim Kerr about you. Oh, lovely, thank you. Well, it, Live in the City of Lights era. Yeah, that's really cool. It's there because I... Um, I shaved the sides. Obviously, I can't go to the barbers. So I bought some clippers during the first lockdown because I had to shield and wasn't allowed out at all. So my hair just went crazy. So I just shaved the sides. I clip at the sides to a number two about halfway up about every two months. And I just let the top grow. So what that has done has made me look slimmer because the sides are short, the top is long, and it adds length. It just there draws that go. face up. Look at that. There you go. Vertical lines, <laughs> black. Cut the sides. Chubby boys, we know the score. <laughs> New gold dream. <laughs> well, we hope you've enjoyed this podcast. Um, it, it was just... And if you didn't, there's something wrong with you. You've got no joy in your life. If that did not bring you joy... I just don't believe it's possible. I don't believe that applies to anyone. I don't believe there's a single person going... <laughs> there yeah, can't be, me. can there? And that is not an egotistical reflection of Paul or I. That is purely down to Chris Bart Williams. 100%. It, what a guy. And just imagine, I mean, we, I get giddy just thinking about being in the pub with you again, but imagine the Bartman comes over and we're in a bar with him at some point this year. But what he did say, didn't he? He's, gonna, he's looking at bringing his team over. Uh, hoping to play Forest. That'd be brilliant. Follow us on Twitter then, because we do announce who the guests are sometimes. So if you've got a memory or a story or a question, then you can uh, get in touch. We'll see you next time. You're right. You're right.